Okay, so we're going to jump in on the top of page 24, and where we left off last week is we had read paragraph one, which is the italicized paragraph. Uh, but let's reread that because um, we cannot um, – we don't want to gloss over these, these italicized paragraphs in particular. Squiggly writing, italics, extra important. So here we go. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. So what we're doing here, I'm David, I'm a recovered alcoholic. Uh, so from this point of the book, to the end of 164, which is the text of Alcoholics Anonymous, we're not going to talk about drink in our bodies any longer. I think the reason for that is, is drink isn't the problem. The problem is that I'm powerless before I take a drink. And we're going to talk about this as, as David just read the italic writing here. So italic writing means very important. You need to pay attention to this. You know, Joe and Charlie call it squiggly writing. That's it. What we're going to, what, drink is not the problem. Thinking is a problem. So let's see how many times Bill references on this page alone that we have a thinking problem. And it started out in the prior paragraph, and I'll number them as we go through. There's a couple in each paragraph. But the prior paragraph on the top on, of 24, they use the word at a certain point in their drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire, that is also, that's thinking, to stop drinking is absolutely a no avail. Go to the squiggly writing. The fact, remember this is a fact, is that most alcoholics, for, for reasons yet obscure, so not easily understood, I don't understand, have lost the power of choice in drink. There's another one there, in thinking. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We're unable at certain times, not certain times, I'm unable at all times, to bring in my consciousness sufficient force, the memory, the suffering, the humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. I'm without defense. I have no power, no choice, no control. After 24, almost 24 years of continuous sobriety, I don't get to wake up tomorrow morning and be, have regained power of choice when it comes to drink. I, would have not, I will not regain that ever. I am a real alcoholic. So, I just want to draw attention to the second sentence in the squiggly writing, our so-called willpower. So, I probably should have asked Sam to look this up. I just grabbed it myself, Sam. Willpower, the ability to control one's own actions, emotions, or how about this, or urges. So, our so-called ability to control my urges becomes practically non-existent, our so-called willpower. So what is this really saying? I'm, I'm assuming the way that that's written, and that, that's an expression, right? so-called this, so-called that, it's when we're, we're trying to devalue something. What Bill is saying is that we don't have willpower, period, when it comes to drinking, practically non-existent. What does practically mean? It means in a in a sort of in a tangible sense, in a real sense, non-existent means doesn't exist. It's not real. There is no tangible, physical, logical, controllable way for me to manage my urges when it comes to alcohol. And as uh, Cameron F talks about quite often, if you guys listen to him, it's where the liar shows up. He shows up and he tells me that I can have a couple of drinks. I have no sufficient willpower. No, no, I can't recall the pain of a day, a week, or a month ago. I don't have it. The liar says, take a drink because that's what I'm accustomed to. The almost certain consequences 
that follow taking even a glass of beer do not crowd into the mind to deter us. If these thoughts occur, they are hazy and readily supplanted with the old threadbare idea that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. There is a complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot stove. I have two definitions here. I've sub supplanted, which is defined as replaced with something else. And then threadbare um, is like an older term for the word shabby. Um, so in the sentence, if these thoughts occur, they are hazily, hazily, hazy and readily replaced with something else or with the old shabby idea that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. So, so what's Bill saying here, right? This is a callback to some content that, that Dr. Silk was al already um, educated us on in the doctor's opinion. So the almost certain consequences, what are the consequences of, of taking even a glass of beer? So he's trying to downplay, hey, I just have a little bit of, you know, maybe some low alcohol beer. How big of a deal can it be? Well, I'm going to get the almost certain consequences that what? I'm going to break out in craving. My allergic reaction is going to get activated from even a, you know, just a glass of beer. And so it doesn't enter my consciousness. It doesn't crowd into my mind to say, hey, this is a bad idea. I don't get that. And if I do get that thought, it says, eh, they're hazily, they're hazy and readily supplanted. It means like quickly replaced with that old shabby idea, like Sam said, that this time we'll handle ourselves like other people. We cannot, after a time, differentiate the truth from the false. When it occurs to me to pick up the drink, when I am not spiritually fit. Right? So today in my life, it doesn't occur to me to pick up a drink. Right? Back in the day, if it occurred to me to pick up a drink, I was, I, when I pick it up, even if it occurs to me, maybe not a great idea, eh, like my brain sort of doesn't really think of that. My brain lies to me and says, D -d 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 you're, you're okay. You're strong. You'll be fine tonight. It lies to me. And I'm not conscious of the lie. It, because it's like George Costanza from Seinfeld. It's not a lie if you believe it. So when I thought it occurred to me to have a drink and my brain said, dude, tonight you're going to have two, you're going to be okay. It wasn't a lie because I believed it. I could not differentiate the truth from the false. I'm going to be able to handle myself like other people. I'll behave tonight. I'll make it home in time. I'll have two. I won't call the dealer. I won't do any of that stuff. I won't drink and drive. Complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot stove. What is the kind of defense that keeps me from putting my hand on a hot stove? Anybody here as a kid? It's funny how many of us as kids did this. Touched a hot stove. Maybe it's because we all used to have those, those coiled burner ones and they get red and it looks so luring. So what happens? That looks like something I should touch. And I touched it. Did I ever touch it a second time? Never. Never. Right? When I was in high school, we used to have the little uh, starter you put in the barbecue and the charcoals, you know, the little wedge-shaped thing. You plug it in. It gets the Guess I set it on the ground behind me, and I backed into it one day and stepped on it. Guess who never put the – yeah, I know, I missed football practice for two weeks because of that. Yeah, I was a National Honor Society student, so my football coach got, got, a, got a kick out of that. So – Guess who never put the charcoal coil on the ground again? Me. Exactly. Guess who didn't have that reaction when it came to drinking and drugging and other destructive behaviors? Me. I don't have that kind of defense. So uh, as I'm pointing out here to you uh, about Bill and what he's outlining for us on his pages about our thinking, our thoughts, our ideas. So we already did the word desire, which was in the very top paragraph. We talked about having lost the power of choice in drink, which is uh, in my thinking. And then in this paragraph here, it says, uh, 24, second paragraph, the almost certain consequences is also the thought that following taking even a glass of beer. That's the thought. The consequences of picking up the drink. This is my problem. It's a thinking problem, and it's not a drinking problem. Do not crowd into the mind. That's also a, the, my thought or my thinking or my ideas to deter uh, to deter us from 
If those thoughts, there's a fifth one, occur, they are hazily and readily supplanted with an old thread, threadbare. Threadbare's ideas means they're worn out. <laughs> These ideas are just worn out, man. It's like, I, I, and this time we shall handle, uh, um, it says, we shall handle ourselves like other people. That's where the liar shows up again. I believe the liars tell me. First, I can have a couple of drinks. I don't remember the thought of getting locked up the last time I did it. And I don't remember getting kicked out of the house or losing the job. I can't recall that kind of stuff. What happens? Why do I pick up a drink? The question is this and only this. What were you thinking? What were you feeling? What was going on in your head two minutes before you picked up the drink? And then I always get a sponsor who goes, well, my wife the night before. No, 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 no. That wasn't the question I asked you. What were you thinking? What were you feeling two minutes before you picked up the drink? And the book's going to answer what that is later on, real soon here. And I'll give you a hint. Nothing usually. I didn't have, I just picked up the drink without any thought or effort on my part. I just picked it up because I have no mental defense against the first drink. That's why. And then the bottom, as David pointed out, put it, I think we've all burned ourselves on something, Amazing. right? I played with matches, yeah. but you know, I've never done that again. I put my, I, I, I cooked some popcorn with a steel pot with a steel handle when I was a kid, like oh. freaking like before I was a teenager, burned the shit out of my hand. I'd never cook popcorn or anything else without a, a padded handle on it. Now, why would I know exactly where the stove's at? I know what pot I'm using. I wouldn't cook in the dark. Bill uses this reference a couple of times in the book about putting our hand on a hot stove or, or moving away from a hot flame. You know, once we know where that's at, we wouldn't do it. That's not, that is a good reference to the point that even though I know that this is going to kill me, lock me up, get me divorced, lose my job, I still pick up a drink because I have no mental to get fence against that first drink. The alcoholic may say to himself in the most casual way, it won't burn me this time, so here's how. Or perhaps he doesn't think at all. How often have some of us begun to drink in this nonchalant way and after the third or fourth pounded on the bar and said to ourselves, for God's sake, how did I ever get started again? Only to have that thought supplanted by, well, I'll stop with the sixth drink. Or, what's the use anyhow? Say I'm nothing? Okay. Man, I just, anybody relate to that? Nah, what's the use? I started drinking. I'm just going to keep drinking, right? Believing I had a choice. or being complicit in not having a choice, supporting that craving that was breaking out. Have you ever taken a drink against your own will? Of course I have. You know, and I knew I shouldn't do it. You know, we got voted prior to a very important date. Of course I have. But in this paragraph, though, back to the thinking, the thoughts, or ideas that Bill's trying to point out to us through here, that this is no mental defense against that first one. The alcoholic may say to himself, that is a thought. In the most casual way, it won't burn me this time, so here's how, or perhaps he doesn't think at all. That is usually my case. I didn't even give it a thought. I just rushed into it, had a drink, and this is how often have some of us begun to drink in the nonchalant way. That's a lack of thought, another lack of thought here. So again, this is the ninth time in the book. Bill is referencing even our thinking, our thoughts, or our ideas. Um, and after the third or fourth pound on the bar, saying to himself, for God's sake, how do I ever get started again? Only to have that thought replaced by, well, I'll stop with the sixth drink. I will stop when the alcohol stops. That's when I'll stop. Not on my terms. Not at all. And then it says, or what's the use anyhow? What's the use anyhow? I don't have any choice. Remember, we learn once I start drinking, what happens to me? I have no power, no choice, no control. I have no control. Again, I set out to have two. I had 22. I wanted to get a bag of dope. I wanted to get an eight ball. I went back and got another one and another one. It just never ends. Once I break out in craving, I'm off to the races. We're talking about the thought. But again, I have no mental defense against that first drink. What were you thinking? What were you feeling? Two minutes before you picked up that drink. When this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, he has probably placed himself beyond human aid. And unless locked up 
may die or go permanently insane. Hmm. This paragraph, uh, this uh, sentence worth rereading. With hmm. this sort of thinking, kind of thinking we're talking about above, is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies. He has probably placed himself beyond human aid, and unless locked up, may die or go permanently insane. These stark and ugly facts have been confirmed by legions of alcoholics throughout history. But for the grace of God, there would have been thousands more convincing demonstrations. So many want to stop, but cannot. I have two definitions here. Um, I have the definition of stark, which is described as rough or violent. And then legions is a great multitude. So these violent and ugly facts have been confirmed by a great multitude of alcoholics throughout history. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Go ahead, David. No, no, go ahead. Well, briefly here then. So again, this is the references I've been pointing out here to thought or thinking or ideas. The last one here on this page is the 11th one. When this sort of thinking is fully established in the individual's alcoholic tendencies, what are them? The obsession, once I, before I take a drink, without my permission, without my consent, I pick up a drink, and then once I take a drink, I break out an allergy. That's the alcoholic tendencies that we're talking about. He's probably placed himself beyond human aid. I love the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Love the Fellowship of Cocaine Anonymous. What does it consist of? Oh, Human oh. beings. Oh, what? Uh, and it is a power greater than me myself, but it's not, it's a human power beyond my, so this is where the fellowship is insufficient to keep me sober. Now, I'm not saying it didn't help when I first got, came around, because it certainly did, but it's going to be insufficient if I'm going to recover from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. I've got to find a power greater than myself that can restore me to sanity. The fellowship's not going to do that for me. So just going to meetings is just not going to work. And then it says, uh, uh, what happens then? It says, uh, individual with alcoholic tendency, he has probably placed himself beyond humanity and less locked up. You can get freaking drunk and high in freaking prison. Are you kidding me? Of course, it's not going to help. May die or go permanently insane. So if you tell me I'm going to die, that is the worst news I've ever had. I need a drink now. I, I got to have a drink. <laughs> that's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I got to go get high. <laughs> you know, so you tell me that. We'll go permanently insane. Dude, I always thought I was going permanently insane. You know, there's nothing like doing a bunch of cocaine and, and being impotent and paranoid. I mean, that's that's the best thing in the whole wide world, right? <laughs> all locked up in your basement all by yourself. <laughs> it's like, and I thought my mind was going crazy. I'm doing multiplication in my mind because I thought it was flipping out. My, uh, my brains are coming out of my ear. Dude, it's just. But the insanity means, in their means insane. It means clinically insane, they're talking about. And this happens. Absolutely can happen. Wet brains, of course. These stark facts. These facts are known to be true and have been confirmed by lesions of alcoholics. So a lot of large numbers of al other alcoholics throughout history. So the first 100 are testimony to this. But for the grace of God, there would have been thousands more convincing demonstrations. So many want to stop but can't. So this question I have to my sponsees a lot of times is, have you ever wanted to stop but couldn't? Well, what does that look like for you? And I ask people to consider this when I'm working with them. Don't answer me quickly on these things. Take it and consider. Go to prayer on this kind of stuff. What does that look for you, like for you? That you need to know inside, internally, learn to your innermost self that you're an alcoholic, that you need to have power. And the second step, I need to have power. So I need to know, I, what does that look like to me when I try to stop on my own power? and stay stop, and I can't. What does that look like? And then let's have a discussion about it the next time we get together or later on that afternoon. I need you to, un I need you we're trying to understand the nature of this illness that is threefold and how, it, how it, it's going to kill me. You know, um, who was it? I can't remember the guy who was talking about it the other day. Um, you know, you hear people in uh, meetings sometimes say, oh, you're, you're, uh, your alcoholism, your disease is out in the parking lot doing push-ups. And he's like, the speaker said, that's crap. You know, it's, my recovery is in the parking lot doing push-ups. 
That's important for me to know. If I'm doing this work here, my recovery is doing push-ups all the time because I don't ever have to take three. I can have permanent sobriety if I do this work here. I need to know this stuff. This is why we study this book so I can be more versed and armed with the facts about myself, armed about the facts about this book so I can carry this message to uh, the suffering alcoholic and addict. So when my brain has lost this ability to differentiate the truth from the false, right? when it's fully established in this way of thinking, I probably place myself beyond human aid. So Bill here is banging the same drum that Dr. Silkworth was banging back on page, uh, was it in Roman numeral 28, right? Because, and think about this, the way that Bill's right. Bill is sharing his experience of being sick and getting better. Once Dr. Silkworth had explained it to him, then Bill thought, oh my God, yes, I experienced this. What did Dr. Silkworth say? He said, these allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, once having lost their reliance upon things human, Dr. Silkworth knew and explained to Bill, the, 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 your wife, the love you have for her, the love for, she has for you is not going to save you. Me as your doctor, understanding your problem is not going to save you. He helped, he, he armed Bill with the facts. He got some self-knowledge and we know from his story, he still went out drinking. Right? When he started to get better, when Bill started to get better, is when he figured out humans weren't going to get him sober, that he had to have a spiritual experience. Thank God Abby carried that message to him. Right? And yes, David said, you can be locked up and do plenty of drinking and drugging. Sad but true, at least in this country. And we've got all of this history, the people who just can't stop drinking. And how about this last statement? So many want to stop. So many want to stop drinking, but cannot. Right? What, what is the chasm there? What is the disconnect? Is it enough to want to get sober? I don't think so. I bet if, if I asked everybody for some testimony here, I'd say, how long did you want to get sober before you got sober? And I bet it'd be some people, it'd be months, it'd be years decades maybe wanting it is insufficient it might get me going but for the love of all that's holy i got to get into action all right i used to say for years i I, listen every awesome slogan i heard in in the rooms i parroted because i was like oh man what that guy said what that gal said that makes total sense to this uneducated alcoholic who doesn't know anything about this problem or the solution. So I'm just going to repeat those things because they sound good. So one of them used to be like, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is uh, not for people who need it. It's for people who want it. And I was like, man, that's a cool slogan. I'm going to throw that one around. And then it, it occurred to me, no, I shouldn't say it occurred to me, I heard somebody else say, it's not for either. It's for the people who do it. And that's the most true, it, it, that is the greatest truth. Because I can need it desperately. I can want it with every ounce of my being. But how many things did I want in my life that I never pursued? That I sat in the basement on the couch waiting for them to be deposited into my lap. And I never got or achieved any of those things. But amazing how I can get what I want when it, in the realm of recovery if I get my tail in gear. Big promise here. More squiggly writing. There is a solution. There is a solution. And I'm just going to pause right here. And Sam, maybe if you don't have a solution, look it up. David and I'll grandstand here, please. There is a solution. Now, what does A mean? Singular. There is a singular solution. Now, I want to be clear. Is 12-step recovery, according to this book, the only way for an alcoholic or a cocaine addict to get better? No. There are many other ways to do it. And the book talks about if you get a prospect, they think they can do it another way, follow your heart, follow your conscience. But in the context of this book and how this book understands alcoholism, There is a singular solution, a spiritual experience, a spiritual awakening. That's it. I just, man, I was listening to Billy N the other day, and he's like, I'm done arguing. 
you know, and I was just with my sponsor earlier today and he said it in some different words, like, don't argue. He's telling me, don't argue. People want to be crazy. People want to be selfish. People want to be lazy. Don't argue. Do your thing. There is a solution if I want what is contained in this book. If I don't want what's contained in this book, there's a million solutions. I don't know if any more are effective solutions, but there are other ways to go. I have the definition of solution. Please. Which is the act or process of solving a problem, finding a way out of a difficulty, et cetera. So I like that this d- definition started with act or process. So you have to, just like David said, you have to act on these things. It's all about action. Good job, Sam. It, it, the, I don't know. I didn't have, I didn't try everything. I, of course I didn't. It, it, it's crazy. But I tried almost everything on my own power to stop drinking and drugging on my own. And then stay stop. It, it was, I was unsuccessful. I got to a place where I finally seen the liar in me. And then someone, and then I, I was at a, I told the story a little bit last week. I ended up in a psych ward. Someone brought it to my attention that if it was my wife's fault for calling the police on me and getting me arrested and having me locked up in a psych ward, that uh, I was going to drink and drug until I die. And then God froze the liar in me just long enough for me to see the truth. And I took an action beyond anything I've ever done in my life. I went to the pay phone and I called someone and I'll call it on stats for help. And then he said, there is a solution. And it can't be your solution. All my old ideas about how I think I can get sober on my own power has got to be, I got to let go of those ideas. And just a little preview of what the rest of the work looks like in Alcoholics Anonymous, relationships. Whatever way I think I need to have a relationship with other human beings, or with God, I got to let go of them all I just too, because I ain't doing so well with that. Or with my job, or with, with my bank account, or with all these other things. But this is a process later on down the line. But for the moment, we're talking about there is a solution. And the solution is spiritual in nature. And as I work these steps, because the whole program is spiritual, right? Oh, I love the spiritual part of the program, people say. No, the whole damn thing is spiritual. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. You know, what, well, please describe to me the spiritual part then, because I maybe uh, there's other parts that I'm missing out on. No, the whole thing is spiritual in nature, very at the end. And as I get, take action in these steps, I change internally. And because I change internally, things start changing externally. They mean other people in my life, my careers, you know, my finances, everything started getting different in my life. But this is a process on a daily basis. This is not something that I do one and done, run through the steps one time. No. It's a clock. I never stop doing this. I need to be part of the solution constantly. And David's point is, yeah, not everybody wants to do this work. Sometimes minimum work suffices for them. And I can't argue with that necessarily, but I'm not going to rubber stamp their bullshit. I'm sorry. I just don't do that. My demonstration is that I've worked these steps. It's changed my life. And it's because of the demonstration and the examples of all you other people in their life that I wanted what you had. Oh my God, I didn't want what I had. And I think that was my bottom, that this is my life and it's never going to get any better than this. So yes, I will take your solution. Please take me by the hand, shoulder to shoulder. Let's do this work together. And I did this work quickly, quickly as I do the work with everybody now. Howard's great with this stuff. You know, the window of opportunity, man, what, what does it look like? How, how soon is the, the window going to shut? How, uh, we don't know. Is it a day, a week, a month? I, we don't know. Let's get busy and do this work right now. There's plenty of time to come back to big book studies like this, Howard's on Sunday, and study this book. I'm almost 24 years sober. I'm, I always want to be a student. I, 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 totally. Dude, I am not a guru by any freaking means at all. I mean, when I go to Howard's thing and I listen to somebody, I, I, yeah, I want what they have, not because I need to know, not so that I can uh, convey this information the way they do, because we all do it whatever way, but I just want to show to my demonstration what God has done in my life and all the people that I get to come in contact with throughout the day because I'm part of that solution. That is a remarkable feeling every single day to have access to that power. All right. So you said uh, we're going to soapbox. <laughs> Sorry, bro. <laughs> yeah, keep going. All right. No, I'm done. But I'm going to beat this a little bit more. There is a solution. There is a singular solution. Again, According to the design for living in this book, that's all we're saying. If you want to be a part of Alcoholics Anonymous, you want to be a part of Cocaine Anonymous, this is our way of life. This is our design for living. No arguing, non-negotiable. It is our responsibility as members 
and as sponsors to push this forward. All of our problems in our fellowships, guess how they could go away? Better sponsorship. That's on us. So that solution, without jumping too far ahead, is the 12th step. Our problem statement is the first step. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives become unmanageable. That's our, that's our sort of qualification, self-qualification. That's my problem. Yes, I agree. So that's my problem. I need to know what my solution is going to be. That's in step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. So again, singular. Having had a spiritual awakening as the singular result of these steps. Guys, the next time you're in a meeting and you're tasked with reading how it works, careful how you read it. You know how many times I've heard people, and I'm sure I'm guilty of this too, have read that and I get into 12 and I read it something like this. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, it sounds like I'm saying having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. No, no. As the singular result of these steps. This is the entirety of it. Work the steps. Get from the problem in 1 to the solution in 12. How? By doing 2 through 11 in between. Singleness of purpose. Unity around our approach. One way. This is not about blind conformity, guys. This is about adhering to something that was 75% effective when they figured it out. And we all know we're nowhere near 75% effective today. If we were 7.5%, we'd be cartwheeling. We're not even there, guys. I'm not being doom and gloom. It's just it's where we're at, but we can get better. All right, David, he's not. Oh, can you say oh. something else? Well, I, in the chat, I heard, I see that uh, someone just, I just want to reference it real quick. Uh, what's the definition of spiritual? Set of disciplines for me. Just a set of disciplines. That's it. Not religion. Religion is a set of rules. Spiritual is a set of disciplines. That's just for me. And I think 10 and 11 set me up for that anyways, because that's the disciplines I live in all day long. What is Sam? The technical definition out of the Big Book Dictionary is relating to what is traditionally believed to be the vital principle or animating force within living beings. Um, this is bigger yeah. than human, guys. This is beyond yeah. us. This is not something that can be touched or smelled or tasted or heard. It's God as we understand it. It's Mother Nature. It's the universe. It's bigger than what we can control or conceive. I mean, that's spiritual. Rob put another definition in there. There's not going to be a single definition, right? Because we're talking about spirituality is a thousands and thousands and thousands year old concept. Bigger than me. Even when we get to the bottom of this paragraph, then we're going to have the reference of a fourth dimension. So, you know, it's, that's also spiritual too. So anyways, let's go on. Okay. Mosey. There is a solution. There is a solution. Almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation. But we saw that it really worked in others. And we'd come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. We had come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we'd been living it. When, therefore, we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. We found much of heaven, and we've been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. I have two definitions here. I have the definition of consummation, which is defined as carried to the utmost extent. Perfect. And then futility, which is defined as pointlessness. So in a sentence, almost none of us like the self, self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of our shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful um, carried to the utmost extent, uh, perfect perfection. 
Um, and then, but we saw that it really worked in others and we had to come, we had, to, we had come to believe in the hopelessness and the pointlessness of life as we had been living it. Thanks, Sam. So it was, um, almost none of us like to self-searching. So I underlined the word self-searching and understand that is in the fourth step, the leveling of our pride. So that for me is step one. I've got to have some humility in step one to say that I am powerless in the first half of the first half over alcohol, cocaine, or whatever my drug of no choices. And then my life is unmanageable. And also leveling my pride is steps five through nine. And then it says the confession of shortcomings at six and seven, which these steps, these, this process, which are the steps requires. So requires is a must for its successful consummation. What is the successful consummation? It's a spiritual awakening. That's what that means. But we saw that it really worked in others, so their demonstration, and we had come to believe in a hopelessness and futility of life. I pray that if you're new today, that you're feeling hopeless and that you feel the futility of life has just passed you by. Mm -hmm. I hope, because for me, I had to feel that before I was gonna do any work in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous. You know, if I was hanging on to some idea that I could do this on my own somehow, I, I got to let go of those ideas. And I don't care how many 24 hours I have either. I still got to remember that hopelessness. That, that's that's going to keep me sober. But I have not forgot because I stay really connected to this fellowship to remind me. And I work closely with others all the time of that hopelessness and futility of life as we have been living. I don't live that life any longer. Why? Because of the successful consummation. I've had a spiritual awakening. One, therefore... We were approached, this is the second time that we were approached, when newcomers come into the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, we surround the fellow, we, sur I'm sorry, we're surrounded them with the fellowship of the spirit. That's what we're supposed to be doing. What we end up doing is uh, surround them with the spirit of the fellowship of the spirit. I'm sorry. Instead of the, fel the spirit of the fellowship. This is, I'm sorry. I got that backwards. The spirit, of the, the spirit of the fellowship is us right here, right now. But in the 12th step on page 164, it talks about the fellowship of the spirit. I'm supposed to bring that fellowship of the spirit to that newcomer there. I'm not saying that I'm not supposed to surround him with the spirit of the fellowship because I want him to come back. But for me, the fellowship of the spirit means I've recovered. And I'm a demonstration in that person's life how I did that today. Then it talks about here, um, when therefore we approach by those in where the problem has, when the, whom the problem has been solved, recovered person, there was nothing left but us to pick up the uh, kit of spiritual tools, those steps laid at my feet. We have found much of heaven as we've rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence, which we've not even dreamed. I have an awareness and an eternal change that happened inside of me. And I didn't even know this was an eternal problem, an eternal problem that needs to be solved by a power greater myself. They have that internal change take place in me. That's why it's so important to do this work quickly and then live in that disciplines of 10 and 11 and then practice 12 to the ability that God will give me the ability to do each step as they're linked together. I don't have the ability to do that on my own. Like coming into the fellowship and you look up on the wall and then you say, I'm doing nine right away. I don't have the ability to do nine right away. Each step is linked together for spe specifically for a reason, because God will give me the power to do that. They'll link one to two, two to three, three to four, and so on and so forth. And as I, that's my experience. And as I did, I found the power flow in by six powers really flowing in. And then I have the ability to go out there. Then I can make those amends. But then I live in those disciplines of 10, 11, and 12. So, so what's this saying? It's saying we're being presented with a solution. And again, this is our responsibility here, people on this call, for that newcomer who's coming in, sponsee or not sponsee, we've got to make sure everyone's getting the message. So it, it, it's suggesting here, Nobody's going to be in love with this once they learn about it. I mean, even when they read it on the wall before it's understood, it's going to be a little scary. It's going to be a little daunting. What? I'm going to write an inventory? What? I got to go make amends? What? God? You know, and then they hear you got to get a sponsor and all this stuff. Nobody's in love with this process at the beginning. Right? I'm too wound up in self and believing that I can outthink or outmuscle all my problems to believe that I'm going to take your advice. But what it's suggesting is that the combination of alcohol being a great persuader, me being so terribly ill, 
because my life is hopeless and futile. And when I see you maniacs in meetings and you're happy and you're joyous and you're free and you're successful and, and you're, and I don't mean monetarily, I mean like you're living life, you're vibrant. Because I'm persuaded and beaten down by alcohol and all these other things, and I see that you're kind of together and doing well, when, when, we, when you carry that to me and when I see it in you, yeah, then there's nothing left for me to do except the work to get into action. But I only do that based on, A, being at the point of hopelessness and futility in my life, and B, being approached, and C, observing the demonstration. These are the requirements. It doesn't work otherwise. If somebody's not beaten and broken, doesn't think they have the problem, why would they be interested in the solution? We found much of heaven, and we've been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence of which we'd not even dreamed. And I know we talk a lot about this. We make comments in meetings or when we share from the podium, you know, physically or virtually. We talk about the life beyond our wildest dreams. And it was greater if I had said at the beginning what I thought, I, you know, my life I wanted. I'd be selling myself short. These things are all true. It becomes a little trite when we say it because we don't think about it the right way. Being rocketed into this fourth dimension of existence of which we'd never dreamed is really about how I can change internally so that I don't feel like dying anymore, so I don't feel like stealing from you anymore, so I'm not utterly and completely consumed with fear and self and sex problems anymore, that I can be at peace with something bigger than me, and I can spend my time thinking about all you maniacs instead of me. This is the life beyond my wildest dreams. So one thing I would like to say about, oh, are you, are you not, I'm sorry. Go. Just real brief, I, I want to quote Mark Houston, how free do you want to be? Mm. That's always the question. How free do you want to be, guys? You know, and that's, that last sentence there, the existence of which we not even dream, I experienced that today. The freedom of bondage of self, that is the problem. It shows up all through the day if I am not in the 10-step inventory. So I am free of the bondage of self. I wake up full of self some days. When the alarm clock goes off at 2 a.m. in the morning, the first thing I do is think of self. Oh, no, not again, mm -hmm. 2 a.m., right? That's mm -hmm. self showing up. Now, my, when I went to bed that night and I took that inventory of myself, I took something positive into the next day. So when I wake up in the morning, I don't have that thought any longer. I get to go to work. I get to perform for my customers. I get to come home to my beautiful wife in my home. I get to come to this meeting tonight. I get to work with my sponsors. I get to watch my children flourish. I get to watch my grandchildren grow up. I get to put a couple bucks in the bank. I get to go on a vacation. You want me to keep going? I mean, my gosh, it just blows me away when I get free of self and I'm stop harming other people. I get to have the, that life beyond, I didn't even know. So why sell this program short? Why not do the, all the work here? If I, if I do half the work, what, do I get half the results? I don't think so. I try to do as best as I possibly can with the ability that God gives me so I experience what a spiritual awakening looks like on a daily basis. The great fact is just this and nothing less. That we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, toward our fellows, and toward God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. And you, know, you can read that both ways and it works. Central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way, lives lives, both works, in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us, which we could never do by ourselves. If any of us here today could have done these things on our own, we'd have an empty meeting tonight. <laughs> David and I would be talking at each other, or we wouldn't even be here if we could do this on our own.
You're on mute, bro. <laughs> this is the second time so far. So if we went back to, so here's the great fact. So the first time it says the fact, if you want to hang on to that page, go back to page 17. I only read one sentence in it. Third paragraph when we started this chapter it said, the tremendous fact for every one of us is that we've discovered a common solution. That's a, that is a tremendous fact. Here is a great fact, and it's just this and nothing less, nothing less, that we have had a deep and effective spiritual experience. We're supposed to go to the back of the book and do the spiritual experience, possibly, which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life. I have a brand new attitude. That's what I've been looking for. Rob posted up there this new attitude that we're supposed, I'm, I'm going to get. Without any effort, I'm, I, yeah, I'm going to do this work here, but this is the result of the steps here. Uh, toward who? Our fellows and towards God's universe. I get to be of maximum service to God and all his kids today. And then here's the third time it says fact. The central fact of our life is, is the absolute certainty that the creator has entered our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. I hope you experience that. I hope you know what that feels like. When you walk into a room full of people or you're all by yourself and you're comfortable in your own skin. Like I can walk into a group of people that I have a, in a board meeting or in, with a customer or with my in-laws or whatever the case is, and I can take God in wherever I go. Like I ask him to come with me. When I open up that door, God, please come in before me. I open, I'm a gentleman. I've learned how to be. God, please come in first. You know, the thing is, is when I, I talk to my sponsees and they call me up on the phone and they're talking to me about this, that, and everything, I was like, where's God in all this? You know, after five minutes of letting him go on and on and on and drone on. Where's God in all this? Did you invite him in? Did you invite him into your relationship with, with your wife, with your children, with your employer, with the accountant? I don't know. Neighbor? Traffic? I've got to invite him in. He's not an intruder. i got to invite him in. Entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is deep miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we could never do by ourselves. That's why I get on my knees every morning and humbly remind myself he's not an egomaniac. I am. I humble myself because he has all power. I have not enough power. And at night, I humble myself again to remind myself that he has all power. I don't have enough power. And that's the humility that I, I get out of working these steps. Guys, please don't settle for, don't let your sponsees settle for, well, I'm not drinking. Well, I'm not drugging. Don't settle for, uh, I'm better and that's good enough. This thing has become too focused on stopping drinking. Yes, of course, we're Alcoholics Anonymous. We're Cocaine Anonymous. We gotta, we gotta. The drinking and the, and the drugging has to cessate. It has to stop. But the real point of this, the program of recovery, is to have a life-changing spiritual awakening, which is going to give me so much more. It's almost like I get the the side effect. It's a, this is what I think about when we get into those 10-step promises. The side effect of me getting spiritually right is that I no longer have a drinking or a drug problem. But that's just the, sort of the catalyst that comes out of me getting entirely better. And that's what this paragraph's talking about. Deep and effective spiritual experiences which, is revol which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, toward our fellows, and toward God's universe. It doesn't say a deep and effective spiritual experience which has solved my drinking problem. That's just a little part of it. I'm getting fundamentally rewired in my head, my heart, and my gut. And I can't wait till next week because we're really going to talk about that. Central fact is, is the absolute certainty that I've got God in my heart in my life, and he's become a working part of my brain. I now think and feel and react the right way because the way I used to behave has been shelved. I got a whole new inner operating system. Like, there's no yeah. way I could have done this on my own. No way. Not possible. Go ahead, David. Not a, ch not a chance, and that's, just, that's the key here, and I know I keep jumping ahead and I point out 10 every week at least yeah. 10 times during the whole thing, but it's like when it was like, it was so eye opening, so soul searching to find out that that was that inventory when I'm standing at the turning point. Where, why am I at the turn? I'm at the turning point all day long. But when I invite God in and I'm having that watch, that spiritual definition, what that means to me is watch, 
watch for those things that pop crop up in my life, but also at the same time, having that out of body experience, like when I'm having a conversation, utilizing the word pause that they talk about in the 10th step, when I do that or in the 11th step, when I do that stuff, that pause, it just amazes me. I mean, have you ever had this, uh, this experience when you're having a conversation with someone, maybe you're uncomfortable with, or your wife and you're supposed to be listening and you're, you got about 18 things on your mind you got to go do and you pause for a minute you invite god in and then all of a sudden you're you're interacting or you're not saying anything at all and you're or you say something that's absolutely brilliant that comes out of your mind that wasn't me <laughs> I, I mean i should write it down because it was absolutely brilliant but that was god you know that was god i invited god in why don't i invite god in more often this is about awareness of that power that I have access to because I got unblocked as we do continue to do this work. I got to stay unblocked. He's closer than my breath. Why don't I call on him more often? So we're going to, we're going to, we might have to circle back on this last paragraph, but I want to get into it tonight. So I want to say this before I read this paragraph. It's one of my favorite paragraphs in the whole book. And I have so many times people said to me, Oh my God, David, you love the big book. You're so passionate about it. How do you know all those uh, pages and phrases and quotes and stuff? The reason why is I fell in love with the program recovery in this book because of this paragraph. Find the paragraph or the sentence that it speaks to you. And when you got it, drill in on that. And what my experience has been, that will unlock the rest of it for you. I so related to this paragraph and I still do. But it, it sang to me early on. What is the paragraph saying? Why was it so meaningful to me? It says, if you're as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there's no middle-of-the-road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. And if we had passed into the region from which there's no return through human aid, we have but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could. And the other to accept spiritual help. This we did because we honestly wanted to and were willing to make the effort. What is this paragraph saying, guys? It's saying if you've gotten this far in the book and someone's been helping you understand some of the old-fashioned language, and you think you're as seriously alcoholic as we were, and what does that mean? What have we learned about what it means to be a real alcoholic? That I got this physical allergy, I'm physically powerless when I put it in my body? that I got this mental obsession that I can't stay stopped. And maybe most importantly, I am so terribly spiritually ill. That's what defines me as a real alcoholic, to be seriously alcoholic, according to this book. So if you feel that way, there's no middle of the road solution. There's no don't drink and go to meetings. That doesn't work. There's no put the plug in the jug. That doesn't work. There's no 90 meetings in 90 days, and then we'll start working. That doesn't, it doesn't work. There's no living in the gray, cutting corners. No middle-of-the-road solution if you're a serious alcoholic. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. My life was becoming impossible. I couldn't wake up in the morning without being depressed and miserable. My relationships were a wreck. I was unemployed. I was full of fear, miserable, depressed. No sense of purpose. Couldn't be of real help to other people. That is an impossible life for me. And if we passed into the region, there's no return through human aid. Humans in my life are not getting me better. I wasn't my friends, my family, doctors, lawyers, judges, it's police. They weren't getting me better. So I had but two alternatives. And man, did I get this. Because here's how I was living when I came into recovery. I was going on to the bitter end. I was marching towards death. Blotting out the consciousness, the awareness of my intolerable, I couldn't bear it, situation as best we could. You know what that looks like, guys? It looks like this. F it. Just get out of my way. I'm just going to burn out. I'm just going to die by the time I'm 30. I do not have another option. I didn't feel I did. I only knew how to keep going to the bitter end. But what was the other alternative to accept spiritual help? It's so ridiculous when I read this now. I'm in my 20th year continuous recovery and, and, and love this book and have read this paragraph a million times. And it's so absurd every time I read it because, of course, I will take the spiritual help. But was this an easy decision for me when I first came in? Hell to the no. Because all you people were weird 
You all smiled too much. You all laughed at the wrong time. Well, you wanted me to call you. You wanted me to hang out with you. You guys didn't drink. Why would I want to hang out with you? Hey, the sponsor, I'm a grown man. I'm going to be accountable to someone. I, I just don't know. I just don't know about the whole spiritual approach thing. What did I know? I knew that I was killing myself and I was comfortable with it because the devil I knew was familiar. The pain was predictable and it was reliable. Hmm? But I was beaten. And so I did accept the spiritual help because I honestly wanted to and were willing to make the effort. I would say day 38. Don't wait 38 days. Day 38, I asked another man to sponsor me, and we jumped into the work. I accepted the spiritual help. Thank God I didn't die. So I'm not going to – I won't talk about this paragraph simply because of respect to the group and uh, it's 8 o'clock, top of the hour uh, here in Central Time. Uh, but we are going to circle back to it next week. We're going to go again. <laughs> so I'm just saying – I just wanted to reemphasize what David said, and it's true for me too. Find a favorite paragraph that you love, and I go, maybe you guys have figured this out already or not. I love page 84, second paragraph, 10-step disciplines. I love them, right, Sam? I just I can't get enough of that for me. That's, that is my favorite. So find something favorite that makes you passionate about it, and I think somehow it just makes me want to find out more and more about this book. So thank you guys all for being here. Thank you, Rob, for everything that you do in the chat and all the stuff you did, and Sam, and everyone for being here tonight. And uh, we close this meeting with the third step first is on uh, page 63 in our second paragraph. For those who'd like to join, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those that would help with thy power, thy love, Thy way of life, may I do thy will always. Again, thank you guys so much for being here.